Thanks, everybody, for coming in. I think we're ready to go. It is uh, indeed a great pleasure to welcome back to the A Jean-Louis Cohen, who has been to, to this school many, many times over the years, um, and who returns today to speak on work uh, related to his current research interests, particularly in the middle years of the 20th century. Uh, Jean-Louis trained as an architect um, before gaining a PhD as a historian in Paris. He continues, in fact, a brilliant tradition within architecture of architect-trained historians who are a very interesting subset of, let's say, all historians and of who are of defrocked <laughs> architects. <laughs> <laughs> who find other means yeah, and other interests. Um, uh, since 1993, he's been professor and chair of the history of architecture at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts, which is his base in North America, uh, and of course in Europe is in Paris, uh, and then goes back and forth between those two cities throughout every year. Uh, in 1998 to 2003, he led a project for the city of, the city of Architecture in Paris during five years, a cultural center that was set up in that city and operated then in the, uh, his area of interest is very much 20th century architecture and architectural culture, and especially across Europe, Germany, uh, Russia, or what was once called the Soviet Union, and his interest in early 20th century architecture um, in the Soviet Union especially was a topic that brought him to this school many, many times um, at a period in which that architecture was animating, particularly suprematist, and constructivist architecture of the revolutionary period in the Soviet Union was animating this school in a number of different ways um, and has been a frequent visitor and contributor over the years since um, on all kinds of topics in uh, modern and contemporary architecture. His recent publications um, survey the work of architects like Tony Garnier, uh, Mies van der Rohe, uh, Le Corbusier, of which he is one of the world's great scholars, um, and many other architects. In 2007, uh, Jean-Louis wrote a remarkable 80-page introduction to a long-awaited translation or retranslation of what was finally properly called Towards an Architecture, uh, Le Corbusier's first great major book um, published in the 1920s um, in which he very much situates that book not just in the context of architecture but interestingly I in the mind and activities of the young Swiss architect who wrote it um, and in that way I think made a great contribution to a field that's always struggled with understanding um, exactly what that revolutionary text was meant to do. Please join me in welcoming back to the age on the week. Thank you, Bert. Uh, does the mic work? Yes. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. I remember having been here first uh, exactly uh, Horesco reference, as they say in Latin, 40 years ago. <laughs> as a student, having done the revolution at uh, Paris, Ecole des Beaux-Arts, uh, there were two reasons to come to London, maybe three. Uh, the first one was, uh, of course, architecture, especially the architecture of Jim Sterling. The second was architectural design, uh, the magazine ra then run by uh, Monica Pigeon and uh, Robin Middleton. And the third was the AA as a sort of place where an alternative education was emerging. So it drew us like a magnet. And then I had many other opportunities to, to be here. So today I want to discuss um, a uh, missing chapter in the history of 20th century architecture. Uh, this missing chapter is what you can see on the screen uh, with a question mark. And the question is, uh, here we see the uh, summary of one of several histories of 20th century architecture. This one is the one by uh, Manfredo Tafuri and Francesco Dalco, a rather strange book in many uh, regards, but it uh, uh, res it, it corresponds to the canon. In short, between 39 and 45, nothing happens. Between, and I take two examples, the Casa del Fascio on the left, I could take uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, and I t here on the right, the post-war encounter of uh, mass production and uh, new policies in the guise of Levittown. Nothing happens, yet a lot happens. And I'm 
uh, extremely interested for reasons I will not mask in discussing this uh, unknown moment, but a uh, known yet intense moment in architectural history. Uh, we find polar relationships between uh, architects during that period, and I would characterize them here with these two characters. Uh, here, Albert Speer, architect trained in Berlin, uh, Minister of Armament for Hitler's Third Reich and a war criminal sentenced uh, to 20 years in jail at the Nuremberg trial in 1946. Um, uh, Speer supervised, for instance, the production of V2 and V1 rockets, the ones that hit London during the Second Blitz, in these caves in central Germany where the uh, producers, the workers, were concentration camp prisoners who died by thousands. On the right, we see one of Speer's direct victims, in a way, another architect, uh, Simon Circus, who was one of the founders of the Polish group of the International Congresses of Modern Architecture, was in the resistance, was arrested, and became a prisoner uh, in uh, Auschwitz in a concentration camp. It was working for the war effort led by this other architect, um, uh, Albert Speer. So beyond these two extreme destinies, and we'll return to some architectural destinies, I'm extremely uh, interested in what war has meant for architecture, what has been the effect of the war conditions and of, of war culture on, architect on architecture at a key moment in the encounter of what I would call the cultural strategies of modernism and the state-led strategies of modernization. My personal uh, relationship with this topic is uh, a direct one. I was born after the war, uh, and I won't bore you today with biographical details, but just one uh, interesting aspect is uh, what you see here. Uh, these two images uh, give you an idea of where my parents were during the war. Uh, on the left, uh, this is an air view of Auschwitz, the concentration camp in higher Silesia in Poland. My mother was there and spent more than two years in Auschwitz. Um, and by the way, worked since the Nazis were using all the resources and all the forces. She worked in, since she had studied chemistry in, in a chemical lab which was using, sorry, which was using the um, uh, plants grown in the greenhouse produced by Simon Circus as a prisoner to grow uh, plants with which the Nazis try to produce artificial rubber. Okay, so my mom works in a lab in Auschwitz and we saved her life and, made, and, and it's the reason why I'm here today because it was a heated building. And on the right, this is a poster of the Vichy regime against the French resistance. My dad was in the French left wing underground where he remained for, five, for four years. So this is the story and it gives, in a way, working on this period for me is a sort of reconciliation between architecture, history, and these personal episodes. Uh, a last personal touch. As a kid, one of my favorite readings was an amazing cartoon book called The Beast is Dead, World War War Among the Animals. Well, it was a fabulous discussion of the war, and you see on the right every nation was uh, represented by particular animals. So of course the Germans were wolves, the, the Americans were uh, bisons, the Russians were bears, uh, the Brits were dogs, uh, <laughs> and the Japanese were monkeys. So we have a certain, a certain uh, basic elementary races, this story was for me a fabulous, fabulous book of uh, stories. Hence, the question emerges, what were the architects do, do, doing during the war? And it's not an easy task to answer the question. Uh, archives are missing. Suddenly, in the archive of Pierluigi Nervi, for instance, the, the Italian engineer who is a maniac recording every move in his life, keeping all the laundry notes and the subway tickets and all the postcards, nothing uh, about what happens between uh, 43 and 45, nothing. In the archives of German architects, the same story. So one has to work a lot to understand. 
uh, not exactly what the masters uh, whom we see here on this cover of the Italian magazine were doing, but to understand what other very meaningful architects were, uh, were doing during that time. So here we see a series of uh, well-known characters, Eric Mendelssohn, Alvar Alto, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, here uh, Eric Gunnar Asplund, who was Swedish and died early, so was not part of the story, Le Corbusier, who was very active, Walter Gropius, Miss Van Der Rohe, who started building in Chicago uh, only uh, at IIT, only because IIT was a key uh, uh, part of, a of the American war effort. And Richard Neutra, who also worked, was active for wartime programs. So all these architects, in fact, had an intense activity of one kind or another. And beyond them, you find a group of very many uh, architects who were uh, really engaged deeply in, um, in all these uh, stories. Here, Speer, again, uh, Minister of the Reich, organizing, uh, organizing wartime production and working in, uh, uh, and, uh, and also working on the reconstruction of Germany. Here, uh, people who worked with him and who had a brilliant career after the war in Western Germany, Herbert Rimpel. Rimpel is not a concept, but Rimpel was uh, the Nazi SOM or the Nazi Albert Kahn building. Uh, he had a multinational firm during the war with hundreds of architects <laughs> working for him in Prague or uh, in occupied Prague or Paris. And Rimpel is very still no monograph on this guy. Constantin Gutschow, who was the architect of Hamburg, Tams, who was the main collaborator of Speer and who became the head planner of uh, Dusseldorf. Then we find on the other side people who had interesting destinies. Antonin Raymond, the che Czech architect who had worked with, um, uh, uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, also active, as we'll see, uh, for wartime projects. Dan Kiley, the great uh, US uh, 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 landscape architect who worked for the military corp of engineer. Laszlo Mohoy Noj, the Bauhaus Meister who taught camouflage I at the Chicago Institute of Design. Uh, Bertolt Lubetkin who designed before the war uh, uh, air raid protection shelter. Konrad Waxman who worked on sophisticated uh, uh, prefabrication system. The IMSES who developed plywood structures and of course architects who uh, were uh, among the war's victims. There were many architects who were fighting uh, and got killed. Others who were arrested and died in the camps, like Giuseppe Pagano here, a great figure of uh, Italian rationalism and the, um, and the uh, director of Casabella. He died in Mauthausen, while Terrani, who was a convinced fascist and never stopped to be one, died uh, after returning from the German front, and we've seen already our friend Circus. Um, one could say that uh, the Western intellectuals, artists, and sometimes the architects had welcomed the idea of the war uh, before it happened, and one has to realize here that many of, uh, not of the ones I'm mentioning here, but series of uh, uh, major, major uh, builders of, modern, of mo modernist cultures were expecting the war with a certain uh, enthusiasm. This is the case, for instance, on, on the left, uh, um, a painting by a futurist painter of World War I, Gino Severini, celebr celebrating uh, fights on the trenches. But if we hear the founder or read the founder of Italian futurism, uh, uh, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, he celebrates the beauty of the war at the time of Mussolini's invasion of, it of Ethiopia. And I quote here uh, Marinetti, war is beautiful because it combines the gunfire, the cannonades, the ceasefire, the sense, and the stench of petrifaction into a symphony. War is beautiful because it creates new architecture like that of the big tanks, the geometrical formation flights, the smoke spirals from burning villages and many others. And here what we see on the right is precisely, um, uh, corresponds precisely to what Marinetti writes in 1937. It's a photograph published by Le Corbusier in his book um, Aircraft, published in London in 1935, where he precisely uh, 
uh, rhapsodize over the beauty uh, of um, airplanes flying and, um, and, uh, and, and, and dog fights in the air. So there, were s there was a sort of aesthetic expectation of the war, and at the same time, architects engaged in a political, uh, in politi politically conscious and, and well aware of the uh, threat of Nazism and fascism. World War II also touches architecture because it's a war against the cities and a war in the cities. And here I want to uh, make a very important, uh, very clear point. Uh, World War II is the first war in which there is no longer a distinction between front and rear. It had started slightly in World War I, but World War II is a war in which uh, airplanes allow for strikes hundreds of miles away from the front line. And this, of course, completely changes uh, the engagement of, uh, of cities and territories. Here we see on the left a city where, uh, far, where, where a battle took place, Stalingrad in Russia, uh, probably the biggest urban battle of the, and one of the largest of the war. And on the right, Dresden, after the English-American raids of uh, April 1943. Um, uh, the French writer André Morois, and I, I will not uh, bore you with quotes, but this one is an interesting one, wrote in the 30s, uh, the next war will be so awful that uh, all uh, the ones who have experienced this war, it's, he, he puts this quote in the mouth of an English officer during World War I. And this English officer, Colonel Bramble, uh, says, the next war will be so awful that all the ones who have um, resisted to this one uh, will, be, will, uh, will remember, who have experienced this one, will remember it with regret. So that World War I will be regretted. Cities in the rear will be entirely destroyed by uh, air attacks. This is what happened. Uh, so architects were engaged in a fairly new type of warfare which dealt directly with cities and in cities. What do I mean when I'm discussing the war? And here I want to be uh, rather clear. Uh, it's a, the, the story begins, in fact, in Spain. And I would take as a first uh, uh, marker for my narrative tonight the bombing of Guernica in Spain, re best remembered because of Picasso's massive painting exhibited at the Paris Fair of 37 and then brought to MoMA in New York before returning to Spain after Franco's <coughs> death. And the war ends, of course, with another blow to a city, with the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the summer of 1945. So wars, it starts in, in, the war starts with cities and ends with cities. Uh, at the same time, and this is uh, a last general consideration, uh, there have been many wars since World War II, and there are still some wars being fought today. Uh, this one was unquestionably and remains, uh, if the concept, if the notion can be accepted, a just one. Uh, human can can be happy to have uh, uh, to have triumph over fascism and Nazism, and um, whereas the colonial wars fought since, and a series of uh, civilian wars have been really. Uh, awful uh, uh, events and uh, horror stories. This one is really a very, has been a very important one and one the democracies had to win. Okay, so where are the architects and where is architecture? Architecture is in present in many ways during the war. It's present, of course, in the large uh, fortification schemes which are created all over Europe. Here we see two, two posters or two images, one of the French Maginot Line built in the 30s, spanning 300 or 300, 400 kilometers, an extremely sophisticated f fighting machine, partly underground, partly of, o over the ground, which never was not very active as the Germans decided to go around it in 1940. O on the right, an image of the Atlantic Wall, the Nazi Wall spanning 3,000 kilometers, not 300, from Norway to the Spanish border. So the war saw the construction of gigantic schemes in which architects were not engaged, but in which the building industry was engaged. And this had, after the war, a massive impact on uh, uh, the 
on reconstruction and the policy of low-cost housing. In the case of the uh, French, for instance, of the French mass housing schemes after 45, the organization of the building industry and the public works industry achieved during the war a load for massive, the massive intervention of uh, uh, concrete technology, which would not have been possible otherwise. Architects sometimes deal with fortifications, and here is an amusing, if we can use the term amusing, event. Uh, on the right, you see a sketch showing you Ludwig Mies van der Rohe working on the model of his glass skyscraper in Berlin in 1922. The guy who made the sketch is, um, uh, was an architect, Sergius Rügenberg, who's, who stayed the office manager of Mies for 12 years. He's in particular the guy who basically designed uh, the Barcelona Pavilion. During the early times of the year, war, he works for the Luftwaffe and designs <laughs> the bunker, this sort of rather beautiful and abstract bunker on the left. I'm not here to make a moral judgment, and it was certainly, uh, certainly uh, better for a rather still young architect to be working in a Luftwaffe drafting office with tea served at five every day than being in Stalingrad. Uh, so one understands why the architects tried everything to escape, um, uh, to escape the draft. And it's interesting to see that in Germany, the Luftwaffe had more, because, because it was dealing with airplanes and modern technology, was ready to employ people who were outspoken uh, functionalists. Another example uh, which is uh, uh, amazing of architects trying to design their own, their own projects answering the uh, problems of the requirements of fortification is this underground airplane hangar come house of the pilot on the top designed by Carlo Molino, who was uh, rather uh, an extraordinary and a slightly nutty uh, architect living in, Tur in, in Turin. Uh, I uh, think that the inspiration comes from the House of Tomorrow built at the Chicago World Fair of 1933 by George Keck, the idea of the direct separate position of the house and the airplane. But Maybe there are other positions. Anyway, you see the airplane coming out from this sort of tunnel on top of which the, um, the, um, uh, the house is located. Architects started also, and this is extremely important, working for industry. And this is true in all the fighting nations. Uh, new plants were hastily built, and, 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 and in particular, plants were moved out of cities to close to the front to be built in remote area. This is what made, for instance, Los Angeles the airplane capital of the world because the city was located, of course, was close to, to the Pacific and the poten potential Japanese menace, but was very far from the Atlantic coast. And architects developed extraordinary projects in this context. Here we see two uh, strikingly similar designs built on the right by Ms. van der Rohe, his first building at IIT, the Minerals and Metals Building, a building which deals, in fact, with a, a little part of the atomic program of the US. And on the left, we see the world's largest glass facade at that time, 400 meters, uh, Albert Kahn, the uh, Chrysler tank arsenal in Detroit. Of course, less elegant, less classical, but nonetheless, very impressive. So architects started working for production uh, at an extremely large, large scale. This is the case of Albert Kahn. Here we see the interior of this building in, um, uh, in uh, Detroit. And here, the way in which Albert Kahn was pictured by the American architectural press, the producer of production line, someone who was capable of producing factories at a very intense rhythm, and who had organized his own, his own uh, architectural office on the right as a factory to churn out uh, factory plants. 
So Cannes is extremely active, as well as other big firms, like, for instance, the Austin Company. And there are some uh, German Cannes, uh, some British architects also working for industry, uh, Alexander Gibb and with, hi with, with him uh, William Holford, for instance, uh, and others. At the same time, uh, there are not many Russians working on designing factories because they are al already existing and have been, for the greatest part, designed by the same Albert Kahn in the 1930s. It's in interesting to see that both the Sherman tank and the Stalin tank come out from factories designed by Albert Kahn, one in Detroit and the other in the Urals, um, where a city with three factories designed by Kahn, Chelyabinsk, uh, becomes, uh, at that time, is called Tankograd, <laughs> and is led by a fabulous Jewish general who will be repressed after the war. Uh, here we find an example of the uh, ex extension, the physical extension of the factories and gives you an idea of the uh, scale of the arsenal created uh, in the U.S. in order to win the war. But the Chicago plant of um, Dodge building uh, bombers, also designed by Kahn, superimposed to downtown Manhattan. It gives you a clear view of the ambition of these projects. But if we look at Another aspect of this project, what is really interesting is the typological innovation. The new technologies used to create these plants, air conditioning on one hand, fluorescent lighting on the other, plus the lightweight structures allowed by the use of laminated wood, for instance, allows for the emergence of a totally new building type what the Americans called in the early years, in the early months of the war, the airtight factory. A, fact, the black, the a factory which is blackened out in order not to be seen uh, at night, completely enclosed, is the archetype of what we call today the big box of the ubiquitous uh, warehouse, uh, suburban building used for any purpose, uh, shopping center, even sometimes uh, for cultural purposes. The big box is one of the few types the 20th century has invented, because if we think for a second, it's clear, for instance, that the skyscraper is an invention of the 19th century. But among the main types invented in the 20th, we find, we find of course, this um, uh, airtight factory. Uh, other factories uh, emerged throughout uh, fighting nations. This one is slightly pre-war. It's by Herbert Rimpel, a man I've mentioned already, the Heinkel factory in Oranienburg, which is also an example of the, this industrial language of brick, uh, steel frame, and glass, which has crossed the Atlantic. Uh, and Le Corbusier, uh, always looking for commissions, of course, uh, got, in the early years of the war, a commission to work on uh, an ammunition factory. He developed the project in 40, returned to this project in 44, and in the end adapted it to become what he would call the Usine Verte, the green factory in San Diego. So the Corbusier is also active on this front, uh, designing this ammunition factory. Working also in the factories, and this is a key aspect of the war, uh, in many, in its many dimensions, are millions of women. And this creates new conditions for uh, labor, of course, in, among, in the labor force. New triggers the creation of new forms of housing. I was mentioning the British experience. Holford Bills was looking at these uh, materials today at the British Architectural Library. Uh, Holford works on creating hostels for female workers near ammunition factories, which will be extremely interesting new types of modernist structures. And the women, women also bring from the factories new expectations in respect to technology. After having uh, used uh, power drills for years, they will no longer be happy with the old kitchens when they will be forced to return to the kitchens after the war. Um, architects are also engaged in a key uh, component of industrial policy, housing the factory workers. 
uh, in America where factories are created everywhere from the Midwest to California. In England also where factories are built in the Midlands, in Russia where, n where many plants are evacuated from Europe towards Asia, uh, new uh, settlements have to be built. Sometimes the majority of workers live in makeshift, ma makeshift housing. Uh, big success, a big period of success for the trailers in the US for instance, but ambitious projects are sometimes made. Uh, this one is a project by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, deploying Usonian houses in Pittsfield in the west of Massachusetts in respect to uh, uh, a big factory. It's one of the few projects, probably the only project, uh, housing project ever made by Wright for a public client in the US. It never got built. Here we see the Los Angeles situation where the development this uh, is drawing uh, from Greg Heiser's analysis of um, post-war Los Angeles and shows us the distribution of the main airplane factories and their location in respect and the creation of large size industrialized housing estates. Here we see what has now become the LAX airport and we see the Westchester development on the north of LAX which is directly related to, which is totally meant to house the uh, workforce of the factories. Here we see modernist architects engaged for the first time in large-scale housing projects. Don't forget that in, in the US in, in the 20s and 30s and also in the programs of the New Deal, while the plants, the, the, the plants of these estates were based on mo the modernized Garden City ideal as expressed for instance in Bradburn, the buildings were very conservative. Here, for the first time, modernist uh, structures are integrated in these plants. This is the huge um, settlement built by, um, uh, by Richard Neuschwa in San Pedro, south of New York, uh, so, so, sorry, <laughs> south of Los Angeles, called Channel Heights, which is made, uh, is made of wooden prefab units. Here we see other examples. Channel Heights by Neuschwa, we see the detail of one of these uh, uh, duplex houses, semi-detached houses, one would say in London. Other architects find their first commissions for these projects and uh, have the opportunity of dealing with uh, a new scale of projects. This is, for instance, the case of uh, Louis Kahn with his partners, uh, Howe and Staronov, he built uh, his first housing scheme after having been unemployed basically for 10 years. So the war is also a moment of uh, re-emergence, professional resurrection for scores of architects who uh, had been hit by the depression not only in the US but also in, in several countries uh, of Europe. Uh, the émigrés are part of the pro process. Here we see the a project made by uh, the last collaborative project of Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer called Aluminum City in Kensington, Pennsylvania. A very interesting adaptation of the serial principle of the Zidlung to a sort of hilly and rather picturesque uh, a territory. A really interesting project. And here, of course, we see how this issue, perhaps more in the US than elsewhere, became a public issue discussed in uh, the sphere of culture. This is a view of an exhibition organized at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1943 on the theme of wartime housing. And you see the rhetorical question asked, which way, with two arrows, will the post-war city as prefigured by the wartime factory housing be like the old suburb or like the new harmonious uh, garden city? So the wartime housing, become, uh, wartime housing becomes a key issue, not only in pragmatic professional life, but also on, in the public sphere. At the same time, uh, architects are engaged in a new scale of design, and, uh, and I'm particularly interested in this aspect of uh, the war, in what I call the macro projects, the mega projects. Uh, a new size of projects emerge, and new types of professional firms emerge at the same moment. So I, I, I would uh, bring together big objects which 
are very different, but nonetheless uh, t uh, belong to the, to the same story. Here what we see uh, is the uh, general plan and a view of the power plant at Peenemünde. Peenemünde on the Baltic Sea, on the Baltic Sea sorry, is the place the Nazis select already in the late 30s to test and mass produce their rockets, the future V2, V1s and V2s. And it's uh, one of these mega projects. Well, I, I, I would call, one, one knows the concept of uh, the military industrial concept, com complex, sorry. Here, there is something like the military architectural complex in dealing with these big structures. So Penemunde is one. Here is the American counterpart. While the Nazis developed the rockets, the Americans developed the atomic bomb and they built a secret city called, uh, focused on um, a plant for the uh, isotopic separation of uranium called K25. This is plant K25 built by engineers. And near this, sit this the factory, in order to uh, start the factory, a new town of 40,000 inhabitants is built in little more than one year by a firm called SOM, Skidmore, Wings, and Merrill, and becomes the first large size uh, um, a commission of SOM. So what I mean here is that mega projects, in a way, generate in a series of conditions also mega architectural firms. So here we have Oak Ridge and other components of the atomic program. Here, another mega project which has to be seen as such is Auschwitz. Auschwitz is an extermination camp. It uh, developed essentially as an industrial uh, facility for the chemical industry where, where manpower, slave manpower was brought and where later also extermination became industrial. Auschwitz was not done by, uh, directly by the military or, or the SS. The SS and the military needed people to design and build and control construction and check the uh, estimates and the quantities and, uh, uh, and organize tenders between firms. In, in short, they needed architects. And they got their architects from various groups. So the story of the Auschwitz as a design has been very well told by a Canadian historian called Robert Jan Van Pelt. And it's fascinating f to see the various languages at work, the language of the uh, industrial world of the serial uh, functional architecture, the more picturesque language of the city where the SS would live. Uh, Auschwitz has remained to this day the largest center of chemical industry in Poland. It's not perceived like that, but it's, it, it has remained a very important project and it was such, it developed as such a project during the war with the participation of a number of architects, some of whom were uh, uh, trialed and sentenced after the war. And also, the fourth mega project, I'm focusing on four here, is the largest office building in the world, 32,000 uh, clerical workers. The Pentagon built for the Department of War in Washington, D.C. in a little more than one year by an architect from Los Angeles called uh, Wittmann, uh, George Wittmann. And here we see, of course, the building with um, an airplane flying on top of it, maybe prophetical. Uh, and here, an earlier project with a tower building which was dropped, be not because of the fear of the airplane hitting it, but because of the limits on the use of steel, even in military buildings, and the Pentagon was built as essentially a concrete structure. But what the, the Pentagon tells us here, 32,000 uh, uh, clerks, he po it points to the bureaucratic character of the war, much more than World War I. World War II was a war of, of production and of organization. And in dealing with that, architects were largely involved in, uh, in thousands. On the first month of uh, war, uh, the magazine Architectural um, uh, architectural Forum sends to Washington a staff person who will act to organize an office trying to place architects, many of them still unemployed, don't forget, 
because of the last ripples of a depression into these many offices built in Washington. So the war, the bureaucratic machine of the war absorbs, generates architectural firms like SOM and absorbs also much architectural energy. Here we see this image in the architectural forum showing <laughs> the architects rushing to Washington to find work in an office dealing with the war effort. And you see also this amazing view of the mall in Washington, totally, the Pentagon is somewhere there, and we see the mall totally lined with, uh, uh, with office buildings. So the war was also fought to a certain degree uh, uh, in the offices. Okay, I was mentioning uh, before the war in the air. Again, this is a topic in which uh, uh, ar ar the architects are engaged. My, my point here is to say that what the war reveals uh, beyond the anecdote, architects being in an office or uh, being on the front or designing a shelter, the war in a way mobilizes what I would call uh, architectural expertise and in a way reveals what architectural expertise is in contrast to other type of skills. So the war capitalizes on visual skills, on organization skills, on technological skills, on design skills of all sorts, and in many ways. Here we see uh, the prophetic book of Vautier, a French military on the uh, air danger and the future of the city, 1930. Vautier is closely connected to Le Corbusier, who will use, for instance, in his design called the Radiant City, a war as a sort of propaganda tool telling, telling uh, saying my radiant city is really wonderful because it will be much more efficient uh, in order to resist the next war than what you have today and here we see this little cartoon and we see that the bombs bounce on top of a flat roof that the pilotee allow for the free circulation of uh, asphyxiating gas, in short, that this is a real uh, wonder of air raid precaution. And uh, this guy, uh, Vautier, uh, bought the story and uh, propagated, uh, propagated the notion. Other architects or engineers were engaged uh, at the same time in parallel demonstrations. These are pages, difficult to read, of course, uh, of a book published in 1934, uh, year uh, two of, an, of Nazi Germany, by an engineer called Hans Schossberger. And one sees that Schossberger says that the modernist schemes are much better for air raid protection. Gropius, Le Corbusier, Gropius again. Here he shows even the projects of uh, Milutin, of the Russian uh, propagator of the linear city, saying a linear city is much more, uh, much more efficient for air raid protection than the existing city. Okay, so architects are involved in this effort and participate to uh, what, uh, what is called in this country air raid precaution uh, in many ways. Uh, here, just two posters to remind you of the atmosphere, two German posters which are extraordinary because of their different aesthetics, this sort of expressionist Nosferatu-like poster on the left uh, uh, with the sort of order verdunkelt, uh, blackened out. And the same one which shows uh, death on top of a British bomber uh, bombing a careless city in Germany. Of course, we know that the terror bombing was not started by the British, but by the uh, Nazis, Guernica, Warsaw, Rotterdam, Coventry, London, and that uh, Sir Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, uh, bombings were in large part a retaliation. Okay, the war is also very important. War to the cities, as I just said, away from the front, uh, is important in transforming uh, the life of the civilians and in transforming the civilian, civilian facilities into wartime uh, and war-related uh, spaces. So in London, the underground becomes uh, becomes a sort of mass shelter in a limited way. The underground had been kept up the war during w the first raids in World War I, but is now engaged. And on the right, we see the same uh, experience in the Moscow subway, which wa had been on, on purpose dug, uh, dug at a much lower level than initially planned, 
in, uh, in order to, to use it potentially as a shelter. Here we see also that the war becomes, that, the, that, that politics, um, we see this image of Paris and a cover of L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, Paris important target. Uh, the political dimension of fair red protection, protection became very important in France and Britain. Uh, for instance, Winston Churchill in this country was convinced that massive air raids would probably bring to a revolt of the British working class. So uh, Churchill and the Conservatives were uh, totally opposed, for instance, in the case of Britain, to collective shelters, to mass shelters, because they were afraid of, triggering, of seeing unwanted reactions. Don't forget, again, uh, making a series of uh, 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 remainders today, forgive me, uh, but uh, you should remember the revolutions of 17 in Russia and 18 in, Ger in Germany. All the bourgeois governments in Europe were still thinking about that. So let's prevent mass uprising in the case of bombings and hence disperse air raid protection, individualize air raid protection. So the meaning of this very well known shelt extraordinary shelter designed by uh, of Arab, essentially, and Tecton in 1939 for the borough um, administration of Finsbury in London, the Labour borough of Finsbury, has to be seen in this context. It was a highly political uh, project, completely, completely felt by, the by, the, the, by John Anderson, who was in charge of uh, uh, home, home security, totally rejected by uh, the official reports because it provided collective shelter. So here in the British case, architects and left scientists like Haldane, Bernal, were ex engaged very, very deeply uh, in uh, proposing this program, and in particular in conveying to the British audience the experience of the air bombings of Spain. Uh, Skinner, who was Francis Skinner, who was a member of Tecton, had been in Barcelona to study the effects of uh, uh, bo bombing of the Nazi or I uh, Italian bombings during the, the, the Spanish Civil War. And there, there was a very direct link, direct link between this experience and what happened in London. So here we see architects at work. This is a wonderful uh, uh, drawing and collage by Lubetkin, by Tecton, showing this uh, helicoidal spiraling uh, shelter deep into the ground. Uh, which uh, retrospectively uh, gives a different flavor to the uh, penguin pool in the London Zoo, as if it were a sort of prototype for this later shelter. S the largest one of these schemes was meant to accommodate more than 7,000 people. And on the right, we see this very delightful sketch by Gordon Cullen, much later known for his townscape drawings, who illustrated and made wonderful cartoons to propagate the ideas. In the Germans worked on different types of buildings. Here we see uh, this is not a medieval tower, but an actual bunker uh, built by Constantin Gutschow in Hamburg, where a massive policy of bunkers was developed. They were surface bunkers and were really uh, horrible death traps, pressure cookers when the British incendiary raids were made. Here, another German project, uh, Friedrich Thames, one of these Nazi architects, I, I think it's possible, legitimate to call him a Nazi because he was also, a, an, he wrote also extremely, uh, extremely uh, powerful uh, statements on the architecture of the Third Reich. Thames uh, built eight so-called flak towers in Berlin Hamburg and Vienna. There are still three of them in Vienna today. And he worked, interestingly, on the idea of their post-war tra architectural transformation. So what you see here is the way in which concrete bunkers could be, since they were virtually undestructible, could be camouflaged into uh, a sort of Ledoux-esque architecture on the left or in a sort of Schinkel-esque architecture on the right. And here is one of the most intriguing aspects of this wartime architecture, this question of flexibility. The subway is a peaceful infrastructure which becomes, which is used as, in, uh, as a shelter. Uh, housing is used as barracks and buildings and war cities are used as battlefields. At the same time, you have military objects which are meant to have a later 
uh, civilian life. The most uh, bizarre area in which architects are involved is based, uh, requires and mobilizes their visual skills. It's, it's the area of camouflage. On the left, you see a wonderful uh, poster, uh, American poster, I think, camouflage blinds the enemy. If he can't see you, he can't hit you. Camouflage has, had developed during World War I, especially with dazzle painting in Britain and with the camoufleur in, 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 in France. But it was then the matter of the painters and one remembers uh, the famous sentence of Picasso telling to Gertrude Steen uh, while seated on the terrace of the Montparnasse Bistro and looking at a convoy of camouflaged lorries, uh, we, the Cubists, have invented this. So the idea of the fragmentation of vision uh, was first an idea which developed with the painters, and one was uh, implemented by the painters during the war. World War II becomes a different matter. It be camouflage becomes the matter of the architects. Here, and sometimes, and the schools train architects for camouflage. On the right is a project, a student project of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts for camouflage village in 1939. You know that schools of architecture, you know very well that schools of architecture are totally opportunistic. They need to entertain the stu students with exciting projects. So what was more exciting than working on camouflage at the Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1939? After that, school and schools, as Brett knows well, have also, in particular private schools, have also uh, to make money. So during the war, other schools would develop and sell degrees in camouflage <laughs> in the US because they needed, while the students were fighting, and the teachers sometimes, they needed to bring uh, new resources to their, um, to their units. Okay, here we see uh, one of the most uh, interesting experiences in the field of camouflage. Uh, this is um, an article published in uh, a magazine called Civilian Defense by Laszlo Mohoynoj, former Bauhaus Meister, and George Kepesh, a painter who had worked with Le Corbusier briefly and who would become a major teacher uh, in, uh, at uh, MIT and Harvard. Uh, they, th the Chicago Institute of Design develops a course in camouflage and works with the city of Chicago. Hence this extraordinary title in the paper, How Chicago May Hide from Bombers. Imagine hiding a city of two million inhabitants and you see here uh, all the uh, ana analytical aspects, the t attempt to put sort of, uh, 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 what is it exactly, sort of moss on top of the Chicago bo Board of Trade in order to hide it. It was the idea of extending camouflage from the, in a way, the creation of ambiguity. What is camouflage in the end? It's not hiding. Uh, in most cases, camouflage was not about hiding uh, objects, hardware, or pieces of cities, but just about creating a disruption, creating, uh, in a way, a sort of uh, feeling of uh, uncertainty when the bombing crews had to push the button and drop the bombs. So here we see uh, the strategy for hiding a cylindrical gas, uh, gasoline tank or petrol tank, for instance. Uh, architects worked throughout in all the, the fighting countries on the issue of camouflage. Here we see a delightful drawing by Hugh Casson, who worked for three years doing camouflage for the uh, Air Force here and left very beautiful drawings. So we see here his uh, drawing on the camouflaging of a factory. Here we see another drawing by Casson uh, about how to camouflage uh, a system of very conspicuous buildings by creating fake shadows by creating, by uh, generating, um, gener generating also a confusion. Here we see an extreme example hiding uh, taken from a course of industrial camouflage at New York's Pratt Institute. How can you hide a spherical, a very conspicuous spherical tank? Here, again, here the architect is a guy called Konrad Wittmann, who, another Wittmann, who, had, uh, who was coming from Germany and worked um, uh, like, like 
uh, Mohoy Nodge and Kepesh uh, knew very well uh, research made in the field of the psychology of form, in the field of Gestalt Psychologie. Here we see a Russian example, to show you that I'm not leaving Russia aside. It's the camouflaging of the Smolny uh, convent in Petersburg by an architect called Baranov. And here is the origin of the craziest schemes uh, of all, uh, a project of World War, World War I, which was started and never uh, completely finished for the creation of a fake Paris. What is the idea? So it's illusion at urban scale. Paris is here in order to, de to deflect the German Zeppelins trying to bomb Paris. Paris was meant to be put in, into complete darkness and a fake Paris created on a nearby loop of the Seine River. So recreating uh, the illusion of the stations, the illusion of Place de l'Etoile, and in a way trying to lure the Zeppelins and the, and, and the airplanes to another place. Uh, it, it, the project was published and was designed, this is interesting, the designer was an engineer who was a specialist in lighting and who, because he worked on the lighting devices, who later beca became, his name was Jacopozzi, and he le later became famous because he designed the lighting scheme of the Eiffel Tower, funded by Citroën in the mid-20s. And here we see implementation of the scheme in Hamburg, for instance. This is the plan of Hamburg before. You see the Alster, the big lake in Hamburg, the small Alster, the interior Alster before, and this is, the, this is the real center of Hamburg. And you see what the Germans made, actually, with rafts, wood, canvas, etc. They covered the Binnen Alster and recreated it away. And in particular, the most important thing was the railroad connection. The main station was optically moved uh, 800 meters away. Uh, this didn't prevent the Brits from really annihilating Hamburg. And the Brits also were very good. There was a, uh, a very famous, uh, in this case, group of, well, there were some architects, but it was led by a magician. Uh, a team led by a magician which worked on displacing the harbor of Alexandria, Egypt, in order to uh, deflect uh, the, uh, the Nazi bombers. Okay. Uh, war was also about other types of issues, and I'm uh, uh, also interested in the material aspect. War was a period in which uh, building civilian construction stopped, and in which uh, most building materials were reserved for the military. Uh, so new technologies emerged, and here we see a project, an interesting project of 41 by Le Corbusier called Les Maisons Murondins, a project in which Le Corbusier, the architect of concrete, works with mud bricks, uh, rough uh, tree trunks, and proposes alternative methods of construction. So the war was also about ingenuity, invention, in the use of other types of materials. And here, this was another component of what has been called the home front. And here, of course, architects were involved in many ways. Uh, if we see this, look at this American poster of 1942, we see what the home front is invited to do. The homemaker's war guide is planning, meals, rationing. It's transforming the high's wife into a manager, conserving the same idea, food, rubber, uh, pots, uh, fuel, clothing, salvaging. So it's the beginning of the culture of recycling. The early culture of sustainability, in a way, is World War II culture against waste for the recycling for uh, an economy of materials. And the brave American citizens who had, were able of doing good things in this respect were given a little poster they could put on their uh, house. This is a, v, a victory home. Uh, a, a, an example of that, and I'm still using posters because the war was also a war of persuasion, a war fought by and through propaganda, uh, two posters discussing insulation. Insulation was absolutely not an issue. It was not discussed anywhere. It was practiced, in particular in the cold countries. 
but it was not a technological problem in most countries. It becomes one, uh, and in, in the US, you see here, fuel is a weapon of war, don't waste it, so insulate, save fuel. Here, the recycling of uh, commodities, materials, which were not directly used also, although, of course, soldiers had to be uh, clad. Uh, another gag by Mohoy Nod and his team at the Chicago Institute of Design, uh, replacing, um, uh, avoiding the waste of steel for the production of mattress springs by making wooden mattress springs. So you see here how they're made uh, using banking upon the elasticity of wood, another uh, type of um, uh, of course, of uh, uh, inventive technology. Uh, in, in Britain, Britain is famous for having been, and I won't show you any images, but in Britain, the idea of utility, the programs for utility furniture, utility clothing, utility uh, hardware, and china uh, and silver in the domestic environment was an extremely important one and it, through which the entire production of domestic goods uh, for the British um, consu wartime consumers was reorganized. And it lasted until 52, and has uh, had a major impact in transforming the British, uh, the taste of the British master masses. Of course, new materials come of age, or materials which were used in a sort of very piecemeal manner, like plywood, uh, come of age. Here we see the IMSAs with a uh, wooden glider nose, which is, made, which, which is based on an, the interesting encounter of low-tech and high-tech. Low-tech is, of course, wood, uh, but high-tech is the press in order to give shape to this assembly. And most important, the glue, the new phenol-based glues, which will allow for a completely new use of the wood, the emergence of laminated wood and its many u uses, it's due to the chemical industry. Okay, at the same, I've mentioned, and I'm, I'm trying not to be too long, but as you hear, I could uh, be very lyrical. Um, at, the, um, uh, at the same time, uh, I've mentioned the question of macro size of the large projects, but there is also, also an issue with other types of dimension. The war is also about compressing bodies, if I may say it in very plain terms. Compressing bodies into barracks, into hospitals, into trenches, into bunkers, into shelters. And this culture of, and it requires a, a, a good knowledge of measurements and uh, basically an ergonomical strategy. And one of the most active of these uh, promoters of a new type of thinking about dimensions is a guy called Ernst Neufert. Ernst Neufert published in 1936 the world's best seller in terms of architectural books. Uh, this book has sold 500,000 copies in 42 languages. Neufert was, uh, had been trained by Gropius and had, uh, in 1925, had been the site architect, the supervising architect for the Bauhaus in Dessau. Later he was a lefty and he had to leave teaching. In the mid 30s he, he gets instant fame with his book is, uh, and becomes in the late 30s one of the main collaborators of uh, Albert Speer and works for Albert Speer on the war effort, the coordination of the war effort. Here we see the plates of uh, Neufert's book, on the left, plates on air raid protection in trenches, etc. So Neufert was totally aware of these issues in 36. And on the right, we see these amazing ways of measuring how much space uh, walking men occupy, reading men occupy, compressed men in, a, in, a, in a, an environment, an undefined environment <laughs> occupy. Uh, Neufert will develop, after his first book of 1936, a second book, which never, was never published outside of Germany. The first one was called the uh, uh, Lectures on Design in German, Bau and Wurzlehre. It's uh, basically a course, a design course. The second one was called A Course in the Ordering of Buildings. 
and proposed a totally new system of measurements and proportions for the entire German building industry. The complete standardization of bricks, which were very diverse, and the use of a particular module of 12.5 centimeters in order to produce all the buildings the war industry is required. 12.5, it means that for one meter, you get eight modules. And this was a rather clever way of redefining the proportions of all the structures. Neufert himself uh, had some humor, and in a uh, vignette of his book, one finds this uh, image of a Greek temple remeasured after the new norm. But he was also active on the ground. And what you see on the right is an amazing building, still standing uh, 12 kilometers away from Strasbourg in Alsace, in Rhino. It's an airplane, uh, an aeronautical elect uh, electrical uh, instruments factory built in 1943 by Neufert. And you see that the building is a totally rational one. Again, it's in a very decrepit state today, still traces of camouflage painting on one corner, uh, and it shows you this idea that uh, the German Reich could totally, what I would say, impose a new module and a new system of, of measurements upon uh, all of European production. Neufert also worked on a, a rather interesting project. We see, for instance, this project for big housing slabs. They do not correspond to the stereotype of Nazi, Nazi times architecture. And what we see here is the provision, the idea of building planning for war and peace, building housing with incorporated bunkers. Okay, this idea of flexibility goes in many ways, the idea of working on uh, uh, flexible structures, and there are some very problematic examples. Here is one of the most intriguing one. On the upper right, what you see here is a page of uh, a book published in 42 by Jose Luis Serf, in America, Can Our City Survive? One of the key books for the preparation of the post-war effort by a leading modernist. And you see here a series of good examples of housing. This one is the Cité de la Muette, the La Muette development in Paris, 42. At the same time, this is the, the same place with the same towers, is used by, by, by the French uh, uh, collaborationist government and the Nazis as the major concentration camp in the Paris region. So, so what is intriguing also at, at, at in the time of war, and of course the architects were not participating to this transformation, but is the way in which uh, innocuous, civilian, generous projects are recycled for different purposes. And this is also a way in which architectural expertise is, is unwillingly mobilized, if I may say so. Um, sometimes architects who are in most cases engaged in on the side of the defense are involved uh, in the attack. And here one uh, sees two buildings by the same uh, designer. The one on the right is very well known, the Einstein Tower by Erich Mendelssohn. 1943, Mendelssohn and Konrad Wachsmann, an another uh, American, another German Jewish architect from Berlin. Wachsmann, strangely, by the way, had built uh, the uh, country house, the weekend house for Albert Einstein near Potsdam, near the observatory. Uh, so Wachsmann and Mendelssohn are at work in Dugway, Iowa, uh, Utah, sorry, Dugway, Utah, 80 miles away from Salt Lake City, and they build, what do they do? They build a German city uh, with houses in wood, houses in stone, and uh, Hollywood stage designers from German origin are invited to furnish the houses, and the houses are used uh, to test a new substance which has just been invented by uh, an alliance of uh, Standard Oil and MIT called Napalm. So the new high-tech incendiary bombs, are which are meant to destroy, to ru ruin the German cities, are tested thanks to structures built by these architects. So I think, of course, I'm, I don't want, we, we could spend the night discussing 
rightfulness of the, the Allied bombings of Germany. Uh, but uh, leaving this aside, it's interesting to see again uh, that architects who knew the German cities were, were mobilized. And it's particularly interesting in the case of uh, Mendelssohn who worked on, uh, who prepared reports on the um, roofing techniques of German cities. A big report saying it's better to use this kind of bomb in Nuremberg because the roof is made of slates and uh, in this other city you should rather use this other one. So there's a great deal of uh, scientificity in the approach in which these architects are engaged. Uh, on, the on the same base, Antonin Raymond, again an architect who had worked in Japan for 20 years, has brought modernists to Japan with Wright, built a, Japani a little Japanese town uh, with prefab elements brought all the way from Pennsylvania on the train. You see these elements, and the same, uh, the goal is the same, seeing how a Japanese city burns. Okay. The war also engages architects in different ways. Uh, I've mentioned the sort of static war of the fortification, but World War II is an extremely mobile war. So it's a, it's a war in which technology is movable, in which a key concept is the concept of deployment. And again, uh, architectural uh, strategies are at work. The most popular structure of the entire war is the famous Quonset hut, the development of the British prototype of World War I, built a uh, design in Quonset Point, Rhode Island by a German émigré architect called Brandenberger, uh, 170,000 produced and shipped to all the theaters of war. Here we see, uh, for instance, the deployment of concept huts in Hamburg after the end of the war. So the war was also the presence of this very imaginative uh, architect, and yet imaginative but really plain imaginative in their technology uh, um, uh, structures. Uh, the war was also a, uh, a war of uh, deployment of technology and I'm uh, really interested in other mobile systems. The two most important one probably in the chronicle of the war being developed by engineers but some, sometimes by engineers who had an extremely close connection with the architectural world. On the left, the Mulberry floating harbor, which allowed for the success of the Normandy landing in 1944, was designed by dozens of engineers working in separate offices uh, and ignoring each other. One of them was, was over Arab, who worked on specific systems for allowing the, the landing of a, big, uh, uh, of a big boat. On the right, the great success, the greatest success in terms of civil, of well, of engineering, not exactly civil, in terms of engineering was the so-called Bailey Bridge invented by British engineer called Donald Bailey, which was a miracle of prefabrication. The Bailey Bridge was based on using for all purposes only one such truss, which could be doubled, tripled, superimposed, combined in order to produce all sorts of work. So here we see uh, the ingenuity of engineers at work. Deployment was also a fascinating topic for architects. And uh, some of them really worked on these projects, uh, trying to sell their ideas to the military. Uh, this is a project designed uh, for the OSS, a mobile delousing station. Uh, the designer is uh, Bertrand Goldberg. They an architect at that time based in Chicago, who later will make big buildings in Chicago. Uh, and also new systems were inve inve in in invented, which were uh, to have a big success after the war. Here is the most intelligent of all these successes, designed for the Nazis by an engineer called Max Mengeringhausen. The idea is to uh, create a modular system made of nodes and struts for air portable structures. The idea being simply the Luftwaffe goes somewhere to the east and the airplanes carry with them their own hangars and the, 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 the buildings for their pilots and the control towers because everything can, can be dis easily dismantled. 
Mengeringhausen was a, a technical, technological genius, also a mathematical genius, before the world was working on heating tubes, interestingly, so he knew the technology of tubes, but also on proportional systems. He, in particular, deduced this system in which you s the node with 18 connecting points allow not only for orthogonal struts, but also for struts at a, uh, an angle of 45 degrees. Hence, the entire system is based on a proportion of one to, uh, uh, what is um, racine, to, uh, uh, not square, but the opposite, root, root, root of two, one to root of two, uh, which had been perf uh, perfected in, in Germany uh, by uh, the guy who invented, by Faustmann, who had invented the Dean uh, paper formats. Everybody uses them intuitively. So the Dean uh, uh, A1 to X format led, and this sort of sequence of proportions led to this invention by Mero, by, Me by this architect called Mengeringhausen. Uh, the system would later, after the war, be called Mero and would be a hit in all the major uh, universal exhibitions of the 50s and the 60s. And it's still existing at all, si uh, all scales and is used by prominent. Uh, uh, high-tech oriented architects. So this is a big, Mero developed his firm too late to build many to structures during the war. Of course, more, better known, at least in the Amer Anglo-American context, is the work of Waxman, another German. So interestingly, two German designers, one working on metal and a skeletal geometry, the other working on wood and the panel and a panel system, but of course you know that the secret of Waxman's general panel principle is the, the connector, very clever connector. So in gen German ingenuity and geometrical uh, uh, inventivity at work uh, on both fronts. Le Corbusier, of course, worked also on mobile system uh, using uh, uh, ideas and schemes developed by Jean Prouvé. This is one of his so-called flying schools the idea of a mobile school which can follow the herds of refugees throughout the country. And finally, let me conclude by a few other words. Architects were also engaged in defining the future of, uh, of the countries at war. And they, they were several futures. One future was the perpetuation of occupation by the Nazis. And some architects worked on that. Here we see a mammoth scheme, look at this, for the University of Bratislava in Slovakia under German control, uh, where an international competition reserved to architects from the Axis powers was organized in the early 40s, won by La Padula, who was an Italian, uh, uh, an Italian um, uh, architect. Here the project of the Lucard brothers from Germany. Here we see other projects for the industrial colonization of France made by architects who later claim to have been victims of the Nazis. Uh, Rudolf Schwarz, who was a Catholic from Cologne and a good friend of Mies, this sort of urban uh, city conceived as a big productive landscape. Here the work, here uh, uh, farmhouses, industrialized prefabricated farmhouses for occupied territories in Lorraine, designed by Richard Ducker, who had been the coordinator of the Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart in 27, and later complained for having been allegedly a, Nazi, a victim of the Nazis. Here we see, I've not mentioned the Japanese very much, but the, the Japanese occupation of Asia, which started in the 30s in Manchuria and China, also leads to a series of projects in which prominent modernists like Maekawa. Uh, here we see his uh, cultural center in Bangkok, in occupied Thailand, uh, or Kenzo Tange were engaged. Architects also works for, uh, to produce vis the visuals ne necessitated by, by, by the war. Eero Sarinen worked for the secret services in Washington. Uh, the designer Henry Dreyfus worked here at creating a war situation room. Another designer, uh, and a more theatrical one, Norman Bel Belgedes used the 
model studio he had created to build the Futurama at the New York World Fair to produce war battles models which were used for various purposes during the 40s. And this is what I call the use of the visual expertise of professionals. Here, Doxiadis, Konstantinos Doxiadis, a great Greek planner, uh, used his graphic skills to produce after the war a very large book documenting the destruction of the war in Greece. Doxiadis during the war had a double life. He was with the resistance blowing bridges during the night and during the day as a ministry official he was monitoring the destructions. So <laughs> after the war he had the info to produce this book. And of course there was another future. Uh, not after the destruction, there was another future, and this future was, uh, in a way, based on the idea of, you know, using the opportunity of the war to build a better country. Not only to rebuild, but to build a better country. And to use a context in which the bureaucracy was defeated and in which one had to perform. And this is one of my favorite British cartoons of the times. Uh, here, a planner, uh, hampered by the bureaucrats, unable to clean the mess that the existing city is. And you see here the tabula rasa, the blitz, the bombs, the slate is clear, and a new city, a new rational city can emerge. So architects were busy thinking of a new future in many ways, thinking of, of course, of rebuilding uh, uh, bomb cities. Uh, here we see a French planners and German planners at work to build a democratic Germany on the ruins of Mayence. At the same time, in countries which had not been bombed, like the US, the future was also seen as a completely new one in which the experience of the war could lead to the emergence of new architectural types. In this respect, uh, the effort uh, made by the magazine Architectural Forum in 1943 to plan, the slogan was very widely used at that time of 1940X because one di didn't know then when the war would end. So the idea of thinking of the new structures was uh, very popular and this particular issue of architectural forum is a milestone because it brought together uh, a series of very important uh, players of modernism in America to define all the structures of a little town after the war. As an example, the town selected was Syracuse, New York, and many architects were, were active. For instance, the shopping center was here designed by a guy called Grunbaum, who after the war became simply Victor Grun, the architect of the major shopping centers. He was still Baum. Here we see the hotel designed by uh, Louis Kahn and Stornoff for the new city here we see an, a, a type of hotel which was completely unheard of in the US. Here the service station designed by William Lesquez, a Swiss-born modernist here. Guess what? Uh, one of Mies van der Rohe's most important projects, his museum for a small city, was nothing but a response to this request, to this challenge of thinking the world of tomorrow. And of course, the work of uh, the CIAMS during the war, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, was aiming less at rebuilding the old cities than at creating a new world. The war ends, 1945, and the last episode uh, immediately after the war is the trial of the Nazi leaders in Nuremberg. And again, uh, there is an interesting uh, and unknown participation of uh, design professionals. In this case, the uh, room of the Nuremberg trial, which is very, uh, has a very particular place, not only in the history of politics and of political crime and uh, punishment, but also in the history of justice, because it's the first trial in which cinema is used as an evidence, film is used as an evidence against the Nazis. First time there is a projection booth in a, uh, in a court. The designer is Dan Kiley, this young Harvard-trained landscape architect who is a captain for the US military engineers and runs through all of southern Germany to get materials to build a very modernist looking 
And here there is also a statement, of course, a very modernist looking uh, court. Uh, and then a new story be become, the, the starts. The new story uh, is a story uh, in the post-war years in which the shadow cast by the war is a long one. And it's a shadow cast in particular in terms of technology. Much technology has been left and has to be recycled. The concept of surplus emerges then. Architects start working on these, uh, with these materials. Here, two projects by Bruce Goff, who had spent the war in the CBs, the construction battalions of the US Navy, and who built a chapel using elements of the Quonset huts on the left, on a camp in California, still standing there. Built a house in Aurora using the frame, the steel frame of the Quonset hut also. So the recycling of wartime te technology becomes a very important chapter in the early post-war architecture. Of course, one knows very well the saga, the failure of Bucky Fuller, who dreamt of transforming the airplane factories into uh, house factories, failure. But uh, here we see a, a fa famous wartime ad, the airplane helps build the house because of the use of plywood in particular. Uh, developed by the airplane industry. Plywood, the use of plywood, the, the use of plastics, the use of series of technologies was made easy by the war uh, at the condition of not looking strikingly and uh, provocatively new. Uh, in the case of uh, Britain, 1946, a big exhibition is organized at the Victoria and Albert Museum called Britain Can Make It. And the key section, uh, the beginning, the Entering section is called War to Peace and shows exactly how one goes from Spitfires to saucepans, how the development of uh, particularly resistant materials for in extreme thermal conditions allows for the creation of better saucepans. And on the right, a page of one of my favorite magazines, the French version of Popular Mechanics, showing the helmet, the GI helmet transformed into flower pot and other types, or lamp, other types of recycling strategies for the millions of uh, materials which were uh, existing. Uh, and of course, surplus invaded also the field of automobile industry. When uh, the Smithsons arrived e at the Aix-en-Provence Congress of the CMP in 1943, uh, they were uh, all the architects at the time were very poor, and they were driving a surplus American uh, Jeep. So the use of surplus was also a sort of aesthetic position after the war. And the final episode, of course, uh, takes us into a different realm. The war is also an issue of memory, forgetting and remembering. The architects who were in the uh, team of Speer tried to forget, or to have people forget about that. Other architects participated to the a thought of uh, uh, rem rem rememoration. Here, Kenzo Tange with the <coughs> memorial in Hiroshima, raising his participation, his own participation to the Jap to, to Japanese projects celebrating the greatness of the new empire uh, near Tokyo, the Daito project. Here we see uh, the uh, megalomania of architects planning some of the memorials. Uh, on the top, a memorial by Wilhelm Kreis, a uh, memorial to be built celebra to celebrate the victory of uh, uh, Germany over Russia in the Russian steppes, not built. Uh, and at the bottom, unbuilt also, but it's a little bit the opposite. It's a memorial planned by a guy called Zakharov to celebrate the victory in Stalingrad. But the inspiration in both cases goes back to Boulay and to... Uh, uh, the sublime of the 18th century. More modest and more telling and more interesting, but also very interesting apropos of the experience of the architects uh, are the two, most, the mo the two uh, uh, major Italian memorials, the one in Rome, the Fosser de Atine, reconstructing the experiential uh, uh, dimension of the uh, massacre of 337 people by the Nazis in 44 and the abstract three-dimensional 
uh, composition of the group uh, BPR in, uh, in Milan, which is also, uh, in a way, the, uh, the echo of the best uh, uh, forms developed by Italian rationalists before the war, with when it was very helpful. The last image brings us to a story which has been told and is being told by hundreds of PhDs, articles, and books everywhere. The history we know, uh, it is the post-war history, uh, and we have yet to, to learn everything about the one before. Uh, and this post-war history is shaped and really uh, deeply, deeply so by the American hegemony. And the American hegemony, of course, which we see here with the two covers of the same MoMA catalog built in USA in the US version or the English version in USA about in the German, German one, propagated thanks to American propaganda money after the war. We know that the post-war era was an age of Americanization, uh, which had been prepared by all the episodes I've mentioned today. Thank you. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, David. Yeah. Just a short question. Very interesting lecture. Um, was it difficult to find out all this information? Did you have to sneak around archives? Was a lot of the stuff secret? Or Yes. I mean, there are... Uh, Plenty of stories. I mean, if you uh, draw the thread, uh, camouflage, deception, you, f you find lots of books published in Britain in particular. And there, there are many uh, military fanaticals who co collect all, all these things. But they usually don't deal with the architectural uh, problems. So uh, the things that are interesting uh, for me in this story are a little bit at the juncture of what is the history, capital H, military history, and what is the, of the history of architecture in which these episodes are almost systematically left aside. I was looking, for instance, today at, uh, well, if you look at the, at the monographs on uh, major architects, in general, these episodes are downplayed or considered as un uninteresting or compromising. Uh, the Doug West story is nowhere told, told nowhere, and I've leafed through all the letters of Mendelssohn to everybody. Don't find anything. Uh, recently, uh, we were talking about that. There, is a, uh, th there has been a new well, a book on the um, uh, biography of Ovo Arab, which is a, a book in which there appears some elements about that. So things begin to filter out. But uh, it's, it is sometimes very difficult, also because architectural magazines were very erratic during that period. I mean, if you look at the, the architectural re review, uh, goes through a really big uh, <laughs> diet during that period. The paper is scarce. Some magazines completely stop publication. If you look at the Russian situation, the magazines stop publication. And, and plus censorship, plus uh, archival secret, it's very difficult to find things outside of the what uh, has been officially presented. So, so there are re real issues, and I've been working. I'm a sort of multitasking guy, so I'm not uh, only doing, doing this project um, uh, currently, but I've been working on this for uh, maybe 15 years. Yeah, please. I got the impression that um, the images that you uh, put up suggest two almost O opposite tendencies, one towards flexibility and lightweight, mm -hmm. adaptability, mobility, mm -hmm. and this is heading towards a, a kind of total fantasy of flexibility which goes towards high tech, and the other is towards heavyweight, uh, and uh, of course reinforced concrete. Um, and my question is really uh, to do with the second. Um, I'm wondering really the extent to which the taste for uh, beton brew after the war was uh, possibly uh, sort of impelled by the spectacle of uh, hardened concrete structures. 
I'm thinking of, in, in my own hometown, which was the center of the chemical industry, uh, if you looked at chemical factories before the war, uh, they were mostly sheds and metallic uh, towers and so on, and they were constantly changing. But during the war, there was a very big chemical factory built just across the other side of the river. It was known as the top secret, because everybody could see it. It was the mm -hmm. top secret factory. And it was completely concrete from one, from one end to the other. And it took three years to demolish, eventually. Um, there was also a, a huge uh, uh, wheat silo in Liverpool that was completed in 1939, specifically to avoid bombing, uh, or to, to not be bombed. It took them three years to demolish as well. And I, I don't know the extent to which the spectacle of all of this uh, heavy reinforced concrete uh, was, was on architects' minds in the period of brutalism. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, um, uh, no, it's certainly, it's clear where, w there, there are uh, some clear examples when there is currently in Paris a big show celebrating the work of Claude Parent. Uh, Parent and Virilio uh, developed in the 60s already a great fondness for a concrete structure. Virilio had made photographs of uh, of uh, concrete bunkers when he was a teenager, so there was an interest in that. But uh, I was looking for a quote, but I don't find I can't find it now. It's interesting to to um, I, f I found an amazing quote in a, in an American architectural magazine around '41, when the new program for big factories and big uh, production facilities were, was being developed, and the um, it was an editorial piece in which uh, the, the message was with these new structures uh, in concrete which will be ha hastily built without ornamentation, uh, probably uh, a new aesthetic language will appear, interestingly. So it's, it's a sort of prophetic line. And uh, it's clear that uh, I would put it in a different way. Uh, if you look at the, what is, the, in a way, the archetype of brutalism in architecture, the, the Marseille block of Le Corbusier, uh, it was uh, built in, a, in an interesting conte context in which the building firms, in which the building industry was being superseded by the public works industry with its specific norms about buildings and a different perception of uh, uh, the finish of concrete, a different perception of the effects or a different uh, uh, the rejection of the two of aestheticizing um, uh, effects and this was, I think, the, the, the uh, belonged to the to the to the shadow cast by the wartime organization of the building industries and the public works industry to build factories and in the, the case of France to build the, the common bunkers. So I think there there there, there is probably a, a, a connection. I don't know if it's in, it's clear in terms of the deployment of. Uh, of the industry, is it uh, so in terms of um, the public perception, in terms of taste? Um, uh, I've not uh, thought very much about it, but it's really a very worthwhile question. So much of your history, um, you know, argues, you know, kind of extensively documents th effectively the mobilization, uh, if not industrialization, of different kinds of expertise contributing to the war effort. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of expertise that, that you didn't comment on in the talk, but I'm, I'm wondering your view of this, which would be the role of architectural historians themselves oh, yes. as a kind of figures. A figure like Gideon, for example, who has an aerial, a, at times in space-time, has a kind of aerial sensibility brought to bear on arguments for the city. And I'm, I guess two questions. One, what is an individual like that doing during the war? And, and more generally, is there a contribution to be made by architectural historians or historians of other fields that can be seen to be mobilized towards the effort. Yes. And uh, at a certain level, in, in what you're observing, is, is, it, is this moment, this sort of hidden episode in the 20th century in architectural culture, uh, in, in some way a key episode in the schism between cultures of technology and history? Or in fact, are the two intertwined in ways that we wouldn't immediately see? I would rather plead for a schism. Uh, now, there, there is one particular uh, moment or one particular experience. Anyway, I'm trying to bring together, uh, um, to, to produce one image with pieces that come from uh, 200 different jigsaw puzzles. So it will never fit together. 
it will remain fragmentary and uh, uh, the problem is to find nice pieces and uh, so there is a very interesting episode in, um, which takes place in America in which uh, architectural historians of the newly founded Society of Architectural Historians, which is a major academic society, are invited to participate to the work of the Roberts Commission. So the Roberts Commission is known because it operated uh, after the Allied landing in, in, in Sicily and in Italy to uh, uh, monitor the state of the works of art to uh, protect the buildings and then in Germany to return art which has been taken out of the museums to the, to the museum walls, etc. But there was another aspect of the Roberts, uh, of the Roberts uh, uh, Commission which involved architectural historians very much. Uh, one knows the term Baedeker Reds which has been used in, uh, in England because the uh, Germans were bombing cities with famous cathedrals. So the perception was the Germans had a Baedeker and w were deciding where to bomb. And in fact, the work of a Roberts Commission was exactly the opposite. Creating lists of targets not to be hit by the bombing crews. And the architectural historians were invited to work, and they worked with Baedeker's in particular and other books to say, okay, if you bomb Florence, please, there is a, an important cathedral in the middle, and there are uh, four meaningful churches, and here a uh, significant uh, palazzo, so uh, please try to avoid those, or bomb them only in case of very, very uh, uh, difficult problems. So the, the, there was a rating, and, and architectural historians work, there is a fabulous PhD on this topic, uh, rated uh, the monuments in the German, French, Italian cities in order to uh, uh, teach the bombing crews what had to be done. So it's a sort of uh, inverted figure, wh what not to bomb. And in the end, in the end, it's, it's um, an amazing, um, what is paradoxical in, uh, in a certain way, is that when you look at the post-war image of a city like Cologne, where it has been bombed almost to the ground, but yet the churches, and here you perceive what is the greatness of Gothic architecture, resisting <laughs> carpet bombing, uh, uh, you have the feeling that it's exactly the map of uh, the Roberts Commission, because the big churches are still standing where everything in a bad shape, wh when everything is uh, only rubble. But this experience of the architectural historians really uh, uh, trying to keep some level of protection is, is, is a really a significant one. Okay, so maybe uh, 18 months and you'll have a book. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. thank you so much for coming, thank you.